I really felt the power of my sobriety like soon after I stopped drinking and doing drugs. Like I um, became far more productive and I was already being productive, like surprisingly productive while I was wasted. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But it's like, you know, instead of just tapping into dark, constant darkness, it was more about being inspired. And when you have a clear head, I, I like for me, I just feel like it really played a huge role in, in making ev- everything that I do, but especially the music. I gotta say, your son's so impressive. Oh, uh, wow, he speaks better than me. He's yeah. too. <laughs> he says full Spanish. And yeah. I'm just trying to talk to me. I'm like, buddy, you, you trumped me. That's the best I can do. Spanish. He said something well, in Espanol. I'm like, what? Yeah, he, he, he only speaks Spanish. I mean, um, when both my husband and I were born in Mexico, so uh, Spanish was our first language. And when we decided to have a kid, we were like, you know, it would be cool to pass that along as well, just yeah. because we benefited so greatly from being bilingual. And, mm-hmm. um, and so we really want that to be part of his like roots and heritage. So it's yeah. cool. And uh, I think kids absorb uh, languages at such a young age. Like I don't remember learning how to speak English. I just remember we moved to America and I was like, okay. Uh, I, my mom's like, I came home from kindergarten speaking English. And so I think um, he's, you know, he's al- already naturally learning English on his own. So it's pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> well, and knowing multiple languages is only going to benefit you in the future. Anyway, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, totally. it's, it's such an American thing. I can't remember. I think it was Eddie Izzard, the comedian. He's like, more than one language in your head. How preposterous. No brain can do that. And it's like, and, and you're right. The younger they are, the more they absorb it. Because yeah. people forget we think in language. And yeah. it's such a different structure grammatically. Totally. Verbiage. Yeah. You just loving me this whole time. <laughs> I feel so welcome. That's Nietzsche, yeah. everyone. Nietzsche. <laughs> I'm so glad you love cats. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's all I animals. One. I got licorice at home. Black oh, cool. cat. Big black cat. Nice. So, oh, I got a... Um, I put your album on for this dude because I'm a crazy music fan. And oh, I, lo- cool. I love prayers, too, Yeah, by the oh, way. awesome. And, uh, and he's like... That's Cat's voice? <laughs> well, you got to figure, I've been watching you forever. You know, right. LA Inc., Miami Inc., I've yeah. seen you on it all, and it's just like, wait, that's her? Like, I had no idea. It sounds great. Oh, it sounds incredible, you. but I'm just like, I, I would have never guessed. If you wouldn't have told me who this was, I would, yeah, yeah I don't. But. I think a lot of, when I announced that I was going to come out with music, a lot of people were expecting it to be like metal or, sure. you know, more in the rock world, because, because I, I mean, I love metal. I've always been sure. in that world. But I also love a lot of, like, the analog synthesizer sounds of the 80s and, uh, I love Depeche Mode and yeah. oh, Depeche know, Mode, yeah, Cure, sure. Susie and the Banshees, all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I think naturally, I think um, my voice kind of lives in that world versus like I can't sing like you know a lot of my favorite metal bands. <laughs> I was like, I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta also ask because I saw her live a couple of times and I saw her perform with Pink when Pink opened for Lenny Kravitz. Working with Linda Perry. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, she's cool. I mean, uh, I've known Linda a really long time. I, th- I think she actually lives around the corner from here. Oh, um, but uh, yeah, she's she really helped me, especially in the beginning, because, you know, I've, I've been so... Well, first of all, I, I was brought up on classical music. So I started playing piano when I was five years old, which not a lot of people know that. So music has always been kind of the driving force of everything mm-hmm. that I love. And, uh, and then it wasn't until, you know, later on when I wanted to write music... And I really had to break away from the structure of classical music because um, it's all about perfection and accuracy. And right. uh, whereas I think, you know, one of the, the big lessons that I learned from Linda was like to break away from that and be okay with it being imperfect. Right. And I, I love that. I mean, when you listen even to some of, some of the tracks uh, that I've written, um, some of the vocal takes, like we, we picked the ones that where I do crack and where there's that like human fingerprint. And sure. I think there's like a beauty in the imperfection. So do you yeah. think that's kind of been lost a little bit in music yeah. with the move from, you know, the, an- like you said, the analog and people give me shit. Cause I still like records. And yeah. It's like, oh, me too. And, and it's not, they're like, Oh, because you say it sounds better. No, it doesn't sound better, <laughs> but there is something tangible. About yeah, it. it's sure. Like, like you almost get to be a part of the art and the artist and there's yeah. a physical thing and the yeah. needle hitting the record. And it actually and- does sound better <laughs> 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 depending on your system, I guess. But yeah, I think that there is something lost in music and, you know, I think there's something for everybody, obviously, like uh, some people like 
auto tune or you know sure. like kind of robotic approach to music whereas um you know my greg my synth player he he always talks about like how our music is like we're trying to put a soul into a robot and mm -hmm. um so you have like the best of both worlds you know right. you have like the the computer aspect but then you also have the soulfulness of like yeah. the human fingerprint so yeah i don't know i think uh music is is cool in in that way that you know you can go in any direction and there's something for everybody but I'm, I'm definitely more particular about my music and the stuff i listen to i don't really listen to a lot of like modern day groups i don't i don't think most i don't either <laughs> yeah i'm so stubborn with my music he knows so when we make our drives and whatnot he knows what i want to yeah. listen to and yeah. it's just like he'll play his stuff and then he just automatically puts on the chili peppers because he knows that's what or like guns <laughs> yeah. and roses or yeah, something yeah and i'm like all right here we go yeah, no, yeah. No, we're good. but uh you were talking about cracks and imperfections and yeah. the first thing that came to my head was give me shelter mm -hmm. when the court when she was singing Ray! murder yeah and voice crack that like it gives me chills yeah. every time because it fits so perfectly and totally. it, it's like more passion in yeah it, so i love it i yeah. know exactly what you mean i love that too yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you in the actual songwriting process because you know cl when you're classically trained you le learn chord structure yeah and everything it's a different else. language yeah yeah whereas like rock music they'll some of my favorite brand, bands they broke like rules it's like of course yeah you're not supposed to go to that chord but if we only play like a fifth power chord we can yeah yeah yeah. Did you have that um, approach? No, I mean, I, it was all just about feeling, you know, and I think that, like, I mean, when I, one of the reasons I think I, I fell in love so much with, with metal was because I did come from that classical music background. And like, when you listen to metal, like the, a riff on a guitar is so similar to like a scale on a, on a piano. And so I loved, like, I loved being able to admire the musicians because prior to that, I was listening to like a lot of punk rock music, which is like power chords and which is cool. I think there's time and place for that too, but um, but it wasn't anything that like, the, it, it didn't feel like there was that much magic behind it, you know, like yeah. magic in the sense that when you listen to something, you're like, wow, how did they do that? Or that must have taken years to master, you know, and that's why I loved um, heavy metal music. But then and then after that, I discovered like post punk and then it married all my favorite things, which is like lyrics and different chord progressions and um, instrumentation. You know, there was like almost symphonic aspect to it as well. And um, and I, I and I, I'm a hopeless romantic, so I love poetry. So yeah. that really spoke to me. But yeah, I think uh, yeah, mu music's music's cool in that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it is. It's the universal language. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, so I, I I gotta ask too with how now? I mean, because you've been doing music all your yeah. life, like since you were five. Yeah. Did it seem like now that you're you're long term in your sobriety? We met yeah. your beautiful son. Yeah, and you welcome us into your beautiful home and all the wonderful people that yeah. are here. I got lost like four times already. <laughs> Did, I paint a picture. I was, Don't be a I was trying to find the card. I'm like, it's Yo, big, ha big house problems. I couldn't oh, find my way out. Of here. I thought you meant this my is how room. every no, not you. I meant in the house. I got yeah. lost. Um, <laughs> like this is how every horror movie starts. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I knew it was gonna end this way. Yeah. Oh, I'm on these house. I yeah. dig it. I love our architecture actually yeah. initially when it never mind this is about yeah. you not me <laughs> no, I love um it. so d was it something that like hey i'm long enough now my sobriety you know yeah. your husband I mean, your awesome son that it was like I, it's time to put something out yeah i mean i actually wrote that album uh over 10 years ago and i've been sober 14 years mm -hmm. so I, I started writing you know shortly after i got sober and i think that like it's interesting because um, you know, I know sobriety is not for everybody. I know some people can hang with having like drinks on the weekend and it doesn't affect them the way that it does to an addict like me. But like, um, I really felt the power of my sobriety, like soon after I stopped drinking and doing drugs, like I, um, became far more productive and I was already being productive, like surprisingly productive while yeah. I was wasted. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like, you know, instead of just tapping into dark constant darkness it was more about being inspired and when you have a clear head I, I like for me i just feel like it really played a huge role in in making ev everything that i do but especially the music because i don't think um you know like you said i've been playing music all my life but it wasn't really until after i got sober that it felt like okay like um i have a clear intention of what i want to do sure and um and I, you know yeah i always say like i 
I would be nothing without my sobriety because like I wouldn't be an awesome wife and awesome mom or an artist. Like I probably wouldn't show up for this interview, you know, (laughs) or if I did, I'd be hungover, you know? And so, yeah. So it's like, I always say like sobriety is first before anything, but yeah, yeah, Yeah. for me at least. (laughs) Did that really help to the, uh, bond, uh, with Raphael? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, my husband, uh, I actually met him years and years ago when I wasn't sober. And I don't really remember it very clearly. He remembers it a lot better than I do. But uh, I always say that it's so great that we got to meet at my worst, you know, like, yeah. uh, and he still loved me and saw, saw the goodness in me, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and he waited around, you know, and obviously we, we kind of had different life paths. Like, you know, I think he, you know, ended up, you know, going, he opened up a restaurant and then did the music stuff much right. later. And then we didn't really connect until, you know, maybe like five or six years ago when he was working on a record and wanted me to sing on it. And then, Black uh, leather, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it, which, which was, it was interesting. Cause like he, he was completely different than the last time that I saw him. And, um, and it's cool. I think, I think, I think like we had to grow up a little bit, a lot, like in order to like reconnect at a better time. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, you know, I, th- I think like the first time where I, I learned that he actually had feelings for me, like he came over and then we haven't been separated since. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Where do you think for you, like, I know for me and working, you've been sober a lot longer than I have, but you know, working the steps, the retrace yeah. of things, was it, you know, a lot of us, we just find it's trauma for me. It was trauma. Yeah, was it, for sure. Was it really a trauma based thing for you? And I like, yeah, I wanted to be like my heroes, like Motley Crue mm. and Metallica, yeah. and, you know, all the, you know, all yeah. those things. And I came from addiction. So. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, well, actually, sorry to go back to what you actually asked about Raphael was that if it brings oh. us closer together. Um, yes. Like, I think that I don't, I don't think that I could be with somebody that wasn't on the same page. Sure. Um, you know, not to discriminate, but it's like, there's a certain language that comes with sobriety and like a certain way of life that like I didn't understand it until I became sober. I actually used to make fun of it all the time. Like, oh God, you have to go to AA or you have to, you know, when's the the step where you don't have to take a step anymore, you know, like, and because right. I didn't understand it, you know, and then obviously I, I got super out of control and, and uh, found my way. But uh, I think that that's something that bonds Raphael and I together. He's been like straight edge for, much longer than I have. And, Mm. um, and I don't think he dealt with like addiction in the same way that I did as far as like, like I literally lost myself to it. Whereas Mm. for him, I think he dabbled a lot and then he was like, this, this isn't for me, you know, and it was easy for or easier. It was simpler for him, you know, Mm -hmm. but, um, but to go back to the, the other question you were saying about trauma. Yeah. I think trauma plays like a huge part in it. You know, I think when I look at my childhood, no one in my family drank or did drugs. Like huh. we were all, I come from a pretty religious uh, family and uh, very PG 13 on, on all levels, you know? And, um, but it wasn't until like, um, you know, I, well, let's see, it's kind of a long winded story and I don't want to make it long winded, but uh, so when I discovered punk rock music, I was about, um, you know, 13 or so years yeah. old. And it just really spoke to me. Like I always felt like I didn't really belong within my family unit or within anything. Like even going to school, I was just like, just felt different. And Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I also was, uh, we moved to America. When we moved to America, we lived in the Inland Empire, which is about like two hours out of LA. So that, and at the time there was nothing there. It was like tumbleweeds and tweakers. (laughs) That's it. Like there was no Starbucks or the 210 freeway. And, um, so it's, it's, it's a lot nicer now, but, um, so there wasn't, it wasn't like, there was a, a a diversity of people there. It wasn't like there was, uh, you know, everybody was kind of just pretty straight laced and normal. Um, I mean, there was some rough areas, but for the most part was just like regular people. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, where, where's my tribe, you know, because I loved punk rock music and I could see the, the records and like, you know, the, there wasn't anyone else that was like outwardly expressing themselves the way that I felt. And so I just always felt like out of place, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, um, I remember I ended up shaving my head and my parents just like lost their minds. How old were you then? I was 14. And well, there's nothing more punk rock <laughs> yeah. than that yeah. when you're 14. <laughs> or Mohawk, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I was, you know, and I was tattooing all my friends by then. And so I think my parents were just like terrified. And rightfully so, you know, sure. they come from a different culture and they... Um, like like many people, like most people back then, they really associated tattooing with like a 
a criminal lifestyle sure, or yeah. like um, prostitution or whatever, you right. know? And so uh, there wasn't any tattoo shows at the time to mm -hmm. make it popular. And I just loved it because of the art, you yeah, know? And it was sure. it just spoke to me. So my parents ended up taking me like to a, they, they basically like wrote off all their rights as parents and um, sent me off to this like, correctional school that's what they were sold on like oh this is like a therapeutic like boarding school where you know they're going to help your kids like you know just be stand-up you know citizens or whatever right. and little do they know that it was just like the most torturous like awful abusive place that i can't even begin to understand that places like these are still even open and operating where was that one and this at? was in utah same, is that the same one Paris yeah, went to? Yeah, exactly. My sponsor went there. Yeah, too. so so they know all about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's How old crazy. Were you when you went fourteen, so I would. Th they sent me there when I was fifteen, and I spent my sixteenth birthday in oh, there. Oh wow! And so I was in there for six months, and like I didn't see the light for of day for six months. Like it was really crazy. There's no windows. Uh, I mean, you, and there was just like the most um, cruel and abusive forms of discipline. I guess you would call it that. Just was. Uh, pr pretty traumatizing, you yeah. know, and I really felt like a desperation to get out. And so I tried my best to play along. And then I finally, you know, got out. I don't know if it was because my parents were out of money because these places are super expensive and we were not of wealth, like we were pretty poor. So I think my parents ended up putting the house on loan and all that stuff to put me through these this terrible program. And when I got out, I think I just had so much trauma that like, um, you know, for six months, I wasn't allowed to use the restroom without being supervised. There was wow. no doors on uh, on any restrooms. So like you just have like this sense of privacy just eliminated. Yeah. And I just remember like once I got out, I was like, I really needed to use the restroom. And I was just holding it until it hurt because I was like scared. Like what if I close the door and then they send me back, mm -hmm. you know? And that was around the time where I really started drinking. And like, I didn't realize that I was trying to self-soothe and try to cope. Um, I just felt like I wanted to escape this reality and I wasn't drinking for fun. You know, I think some alcoholics get into it because they're, they're like going out partying with their friends. It's fun. And then it gets out of control. For mm -hmm. me, it was just like, I need to escape. Mm -hmm. And so I was buying disgusting bottles of like, like, you know, alcohol that I had. Thunderbird or something. Yeah. 2020. <laughs> yeah. 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 Boone's Farm, whatever it was. <laughs> um, no, I think I was, I was getting whiskey, but, um, but, and then I got caught like uh, at, at the, the boarding school that I was sent to afterwards. And, uh, and so they kicked me out and my dad picked me up and, uh, took me home. And I think my parents just did the best that they could, you know, with what they knew. I mean, you got to understand that back then there wasn't any internet. I think AOL just barely was launched. Mm. So it wasn't like you could research, Oh, let's see a Yelp review on this, you know, because if you, if you check out the Yelp reviews now, it's just like horror story after horror story. Yeah. And so it's like my parents were just like they were told by somebody this is a great place like look at the brochure there's all these smiling children and it's like <laughs> oh little do they know it's like nothing like that so yeah. so I don't hold like a lot of people when they when that the story broke about that place um, people were just like how could you forgive your parents and it's like well I think as a parent myself now like I know that I'm just constantly just trying my best mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there's and I and I've accepted that I'm going to fuck up you know and that's part of becoming a parent sure. you know and uh um, for me, it's more just like more important to look at like the things that, um, didn't work for me as a child. Like, you know, I basically took notes from my parents of what not to do. You know? I, I want to break that chain. Like most people like in trauma, it's like they tend to like repeat it, which is weird. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you look at like domestic violence, like if, if your mom was beaten up in front of you, you have a, a much higher chance of, um, choosing a partner that will be abusive to you, mm -hmm. which I think is crazy because you yeah. you know you would think that it would be the opposite. So, but maybe we find some familiarity in that. I don't know. Um, I think I think so because the brain is just how it works and how we identify things. You know, you think like smell and sound, and you know those things trigger yeah. memories. Like if I smell chocolate chip cookies, I think a childhood. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, I hear you know and yeah. justice for all. It's hanging out with my older yeah. brother. You know, what totally. I'm so yeah. It's, I, I think it's, I think so. I think it's like, okay, this, this is what I know as normal. Yeah. But uh, to me, that's a little bit of like unconscious living too, though, you know, cause like I want to be conscious in the, de the decisions I make. Like, do I, does, does this actually make me feel good or am I doing this because it's what I'm used to? You know, right. it's like, I want to become a better person, especially right. now. I think like having a kid, I know it sounds like cliche and stuff, but like, that's, 
like so much more important to me than anything that has ever been important to me. You know, it's like, I want my kids to have like a fair chance at like, you know, a good life, you yeah. know, not trying to avoid him having, you know, any suffering. Cause I think suffering builds character as well. But like, th I definitely think I, I went through unnecessary amount of suffering and, sure. and that, that I think could cause issues and baggage and all that stuff. And, yeah. and of course I went to therapy for years after I got out and, um, it took a, a while to, you know, kind of get a grip on things again. And, and what's weird is that when Paris Hilton released that documentary, um, you know, she had reached out and said, Hey, I heard you were, you were also at that Provo school. Would you speak on this? And I was like, yeah, you know, uh, I've actually never talked about it. I never told my parents all the this, this stuff that happened in there. And, uh, and all these people kind of came out of the woodwork that I was in there with. And it was, it's really sad. There's some, some girls that, um, are having a much harder time. Like I don't think about those days anymore cause I've processed them and yeah. moved forward. Mm -hmm. And some of these girls are still stuck in, um, you know, in the trauma that, that they experienced and it might've been worse than what I had mm -hmm. experienced. Yeah. Mine was pretty bad, but, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's pretty intense. So anyways, I think that's where my drinking started. <laughs> <laughs> Where you are now may not be where you came from. The choices you make today may spiral out of control or spin you in the right direction. Discover a riveting, true story of how Carlos Vieira nearly destroyed his life and lived to tell about it. Stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness. Knocking doors down along the way. And don't miss others telling their powerful stories on our podcast. Visit kddmediacompany.com. So before you became a mom and realized that, you know, parents, you just want the best and, you know, kids are going to fuck up or whatnot. Did you hold on to resentment to them for years after that? Yeah, I think I did. I did. You know, and it's it's interesting because, like I said, I haven't ever really talked to them mm -hmm. about it. And I thought that maybe after I had put out that video explaining like what happened, because these people literally kidnap you in the middle of the night and they uh, blindfold you and take you to the school. I mean, it's like really barbaric. Wow. Um, I thought that like my parents would have possibly heard about it and reached out. But, you know, I also think some generations are like less evolved in like being emotionally available to talk about stuff. Like I, I'm like, I don't mind talking about all of this shit. Like mm -hmm. it's not, you know, I don't mind talking about feelings, you know, I'm like comfortable in, in all my downfalls, you know? Yeah. Whereas I think certain generations, they're like, we don't talk about that stuff. You know, right. this is too hard mm -hmm. to deal with. So, but I think uh, like, my sister, for example, she used to always minimize my experience there. And that really caused a lot of problems. You know, she'd be like, oh, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. Mm. And it's like, I saw girls raping each other, yeah. man. Like, yeah. you know, uh, like, I, I, what do you mean it wasn't that bad? You weren't there, you yeah, know? Exactly. And um, so it's, yeah, it's it's interesting how everybody kind of processes it, you know? And uh, I mean, I don't necessarily really, I don't really get along with my siblings. So I don't, you know, it's not like they're in my life all the time, but but I think, um, yeah, it's weird. I, w I don't think I'll ever really bring it up to my parents so much because I don't want to, uh, I don't need to hurt them. I think yeah. it was a hard time for them already, you know, in, in their mind, they were like, oh, we're losing our daughter. Like she's shaving her head and getting tattoos and, you know, uh, running away. And that's terrifying. I mean, I can't imagine what I would feel like if my son ran away, sure, you know? Yeah. And so, and I've, again, I've also forgiven myself for my part in those situations because, you know, and I've, I've asked for forgiveness and made amends with my parents, um, you know, over the years and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I think in the beginning there was some resentment. Um, but I don't know. I don't, I also don't think that holding on to something so negative is good for you. Sure, and it's no, like, of course. So you just got to do the work and process it. And yeah. most people don't want to open up those doors. And I'm just like, oh, dude, I'll, I will bulldoze through them yeah, because yeah. I don't want to live like this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if I hadn't done it, I would have continued to probably drink myself to yeah death. and mm -hmm. on a lighter note you tattooing at a young age i mean your tattoo you you did okay in tattoos in the future yeah. right? <laughs> I think it kind of, kind of got you on the it map definitely benefited bit. you in the yeah. future so yeah. everything worked yeah, out totally yeah i had to uh, prove my parents wrong a few times yeah right? <laughs> oh shoot that's um, always sorry to cut you oh, off. That good. was always one of my thing too. Is uh, I have a bucket list, and it's not too gnarly, uh -huh. but one of those things on the bucket list is, for example, like I want to be on field for a Niner game. I love the Niners. I'm a huge fan, oh, and cool. I don't know how the hell to get 
yeah. field passes <laughs> and I need a tattoo from Kat Von D. I swear. So I'm just like, when it's I saw that true. you were leaving to Indiana, yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> now I gotta, <laughs> go, I gotta hurry up. <laughs> get on the, you know, 30 year long wait list. I'm just, I don't know if it's that long, but it's just like, and go to Indiana. Like, damn it. So you're it's all right. I got family there. My damn visit. Heart. Yeah. I love motorsports. Right. We'll go to a race. Oh, cool. We'll nice. seeing each other in the future. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. What was that? Oh, how do you reflect back on on that success with the tattooing industry? Yeah, I mean, mean even the the haters of it, it's like oh, yeah, God, which I can't just can't stand. It's like people, you know what? If you don't got nothing nice, nice to say, say yeah, yeah, up. I totally. Well, you know, I think uh, like I got onto Miami Inc. in my very early twenties. You know, I'm 39 now, and um, and it was pre sobriety, so mm-hmm. um, I was trying to handle like addiction while filming and while doing something so new that nobody had any idea what was to come of this. You know, I, I've never was one that wanted to be on TV. It wasn't like I was like, oh, it's my dream to be, you know, famous or to be on a TV show. It just happened. And I, I tried my best as to be a good representation of art. And um, and then, you know, it ended up being quite successful. And mm-hmm. so then they gave me my own spinoff show, LA Inc. And I did that for I mean, so many seasons and so many episodes later, and I got sober shortly after opening up my shop there. And um, it was, there was really great things that came out of it. And there was also very challenging things, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's um, there's not like, no one preps you for um, what to expect, you know? I think like, I, I'm, fortunate, I, I'm fortunate enough that my parents were really great about teaching us um, what's really important in life, you know, and that's probably, you know, from going to church and having those certain values that like, basically like money, fame, status, all those things are, if anything, they're, they tend to be pretty evil most of the time, you know, we don't put importance on that. Like, you know, it's all about who you are and like as a person and who you're surrounding yourself around. So I feel like the bigger I got, the smaller my circle got. And I just really hung out with people that were in my corner that didn't care about any of that stuff. So I didn't have a lot of yes men around me or anything like that. You know, it's like, um, I hung out with my family a lot and I think that that made it easier to kind of stay grounded, yeah. um, and not lose sight of things. Cause I think I have met people who've like started believing their own hype and you're just like, Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've worked in radio for 20 years, primarily. Yeah. Rock, yeah. So I know, what you, you know, mean. yeah. It's like, buddy, you, you, you just use the bathroom just like, I yeah, do, exactly. You know? Exactly. Like, I don't know. So, you know, I think that, you know, there's a little, a lot of great things. I got like a book deal. I ended up getting a makeup line. I did some really wonderful things. I traveled the world. I, you know, had my shop for 14 years and met so many amazing people. And then, you know, then there's also like the, the invasiveness of the public you know mm-hmm. like there's a certain expectation um a lot of criticism and you'll never be able to please everybody which is something that um we all know anyway yeah. you know so i think those are probably some of the bigger challenges but um other than that i mean i don't know people i've i've been like i said i've been so used to being an outsider all my life that it's not really like if you don't like me i don't really care <laughs> like i'm kind of used to it you know for you. Yeah. because the thing is is like i don't think i am for everybody i think that you know i think i'm unique in my own ways and if you like me that's cool if you don't that's cool too like i don't like everything either you know <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the club yeah. yeah that was a really hard thing for me to accept yeah because mikey knows i just want everyone to love me because i yeah. just love he everyone does. yeah and everyone i meet it's like we're friends now yeah it's like Buddy. <laughs> we'll have little pep talks and I'm just like, Jason, fuck them. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> Who gives a shit? No, yeah. I know. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's okay. Yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's true. my Jiminy Cricket with the sailor mouth. Yeah. That's why we're that. yin and yang. Yeah. With this kind yeah. Of thing. No, no, it's true. And, um, you know, and um, it's funny because my husband and I, we talk about it too. Like, we really feel like it's us against the world in a way. And it's like nice. Like, I feel so lucky that I found my partner and that we get to like navigate through these crazy times together and yeah. and like build our own little family now, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's not really anything you could say that like was going to make me cry or anything you know i mean people say like you know they don't like the way i look or if i'm you know some days i'm too skinny and some days i'm too fat it's like you know whatever (laughs) yeah 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 that i love yeah me deeply exactly yeah i got one yeah 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 peace out (laughs) now you're getting it yeah Yeah. Yeah. i I am you know what and it's 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 really the hardest thing yeah my biggest defect people pleasing yeah totally had to work on it it's like 
Yeah. You know, my girlfriend, she's sweet. She's the one who paints my nails. She's yeah. just cool as shit. And she's just like, she's that way. She's a little spitfire. Like, yeah. Fuck them. What, yeah. what does it matter? Do they, are they your kids? Are yeah. They us? Are yeah. They, they're not in your home. Who cares? Totally. You know? Yeah. You go suck a you know what. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> it's hard for me. Yeah, sure. Did you have to work on that too? Um, Or was it? A little kind of bit. I think, I don't know. I Maybe it's just like the punk rock upbringing. I just never really like. I just don't believe in living for other people, you know? Sure. And so you're always kind of thug life. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, probably like t- not to my benefit too, you know? It's like, like uh, yeah, you know, like I didn't go to high school, you know, I didn't, I dropped out, I think my second week of my freshman year, which isn't something I would promote, but it's like, to me, I just was like, oh, this isn't for me. You know, yeah. I already know what I want to do. I'm already tattooing. Like, I'm just going to go into that trade, you know? Yeah. And I, um, whereas my dad, you know, he's, he comes from like a, an educated background and it's like, um, you know, he worked really hard and went to medical school and all this stuff. But, um, but I would always tell him like, you're so miserable. Like, mm-hmm. like, Oh cool. Like you get like some letters behind your name, but like, you're so fucking miserable. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. want that. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, and there's some people that, that they find joy in that. And that's so cool. I think that they're meant for that. But like, for me, I'm like, Oh, I don't it, like, I mean, I, when I first moved to Hollywood, I lived in a crackhead apartment and uh, had like it wasn't even a one bedroom. I lived in the, this living room, and um, wow. no car. I had to walk to work, and I was just high on life, man. Like I would like skip over the the stars on Hollywood Boulevard on my way to work every day, and you know it was just so exciting. Like what tattoo will I do t- today? You know who knows? I might do one. I might not. Who knows? It's gonna be great, and yeah. I'm gonna give it all. And every day I'm getting better and better. And it's like I think that's that's like uh, the key. You know, it's like figuring out what you love and going for that and. Sometimes it doesn't, um, if it's not a hit, that's okay. Like as long mm. as you love it, you know, but I wouldn't want to, um, do something that I hated for, for money. I think that would just be like soul sucking. It's miserable. <laughs> I yeah, lived in like yeah. crackhead apartments too. I'm curious, where was yours when you first moved here? On Yucca. Um, okay. it's probably still there. Um, but I, I mean, when I, when I say crackhead apartment, it's like literally everybody there was oh, yeah. a crackhead. Yeah. <laughs> same, yeah. same with mine. Yeah. I lived off Las Palmas and Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. I was around the corner. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's funny because um, in Pretty Woman, when Richard Gere at the very end saved um, Julia Roberts, uh-huh. that uh, Hollywood bus would be like, and this is where Richard Gere saved her. <laughs> and she was in the slums of Hollywood. Yeah. And I was just like, what the fuck? Yo, this is where slums? I live. Yeah. <laughs> like, damn. That was my introduction to Hollywood. The first morning I woke up, I woke up to that tour and for a year, woke up to that bus every damn day. Uh-huh. I, I just remember one of my favorite memories was like, the gate i hated this fucking gate because like um it wasn't the kind with the remote control like so you would park your car in this little tiny alleyway and then when you would leave you'd have to get out of your car open the gate get back in your car drive forward get out of your car close the gate mm-hmm. and then get back in your car and go and it's just like i just want to fucking go yeah. <laughs> one day i was like not having it it was the morning and i just had to be somewhere and i was like all right i'm getting out of this gate and then um and superman <laughs> Fucking, you know, Superman, the guy that, yeah, sure. the, the famous one, he just like swoops in with his cape and he's like, don't worry, I got you. And he opens the gate for me. I'm like, thank you, Superman. <laughs> I was like, this is the coolest. I love this. Hollywood's awesome. Fucking Hollywood, right? Yeah. Jeez. Only in Hollywood. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how do you look back on like the opportunities that, that came to you? Like the, you know, the makeup line and yeah. the book and everything yeah. else. And, and, you know, it's like. And having a lot of that stuff on TV yeah. as well, you know? Well, I mean, I love documenting things. So I think that's one thing that I really did take away from like filming the TV show because we were we were a docu-series in the beginning and it was like, I loved that, um, you know, the idea of being able to look back at something um, and not just in photos, you know? And so, even, you know, I still feel like I document things all the time and something I'll pass down to my son, you know? Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the books were the first thing that kind of came and I really enjoy writing. I, I love reading. Um, I probably would cringe if I had to read my books now because I wrote them so long ago and I think I've grown up a lot <laughs> since then. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I, 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 I used to write like that. Like, <laughs> like, you know, I'd do like a sentence or a, a fucking paragraph that could have been done in a sentence, you know? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that, that was exciting because I got to go on book tours and like, I've always loved meet and greets. Like, I love hugging people. I love like feeling that energy. Like I've, I've never felt scared of that. And I still don't, you know, and I, I love that. And so, um, I went on three book tours for each of the book and it was just great. Um, 
And then after that, I got the, like shortly after that, I got um, asked to do the makeup line. Mm. And I think that was thrilling in the beginning because there wasn't anybody doing it, you know? Mm. It's like um, there wasn't any weirdos creating makeup lines. And yeah. so I was like, oh, cool, I could do something that's different and that, that you know, uh, it'll people like me can respond to. And, uh, and it was great. And then it just blew up into this giant monster. And like, um, I think sometimes things get so big that they do lose their magic, you know? Yeah. And for me, it was like, I mean, I was, I had the makeup line for like 12 years and I would say like, <laughs> after like year nine or 10, I was definitely over it. Like, you know, it was just corporate meetings and, right. um, you know, I was no longer really being creative anymore. I just felt like I was there was a formula and we created things based on this formula and a timeline and a schedule. And there was like, just no, I, I, just, I hated it. Yeah. You know? To get like a situation, you come into a boardroom meeting and hi, these are the PR and marketing people. So this is what your image is going to yeah, be. It's like, and you don't it, fucking it, get me at all. It, that's exactly how, how it felt. Like after a while, like even some ideas that I would have would be like too edgy or too, you know, they wanted things to be very safe. And, right. and I understand cause it was like, you know, you have partners and they're expecting certain things, but I'm like, oh, well, you know, I got into this because we were like fearless pioneers, you know? Right. And then when that magic is kind of, or that luster kind of wears off, like, why am I doing this, you know? And yeah. at that point I was like, everybody has a makeup line. And I just saw like the predictions of numbers and I was like, it's better just to cash out now and just sell it, you know? And so, um, and then, and at the time I was already getting ready to go on tour. And so I was like, this is good because if, if I, if I were to have stayed, I wouldn't have had time to, to, you know, be able to go on like month long tours, you yeah. know, across the world. And then obviously like all the lockdowns happen and we're like, ah, now we got to wait a year. And, <laughs> and now we're finally starting to play again. So it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you get up our area. I'd love yeah. to come see you live. Yeah. And I blew it to see prayers. True story. I had, uh, I think it was from the radio stations, uh, Instagram or uh -huh. something. This was years ago, one that I was running and I, Direct messages, direct messaged, and Raphael replied. He's like, "Yeah, I'll set you up with tickets in yeah. Fresno." And I'm pretty sure I was too hungover to go the next day. And it's like, now oh, I think man. about, it, I'm like, oh, I'm such a fucking. Idiot. But <laughs> no. hey, an example of how yeah. in our addiction, those things that we don't show up and totally be a part of. And I, I, man, I love watching prayers. Like um, my husband, when you meet him in real life, he's just like the sweetest, gentlest soul. But then you see him on stage, and he's like a fucking animal. And I'm just like. Holy shit. Like, <laughs> you're just so cool. And I mean, I'll sit there when we do like, our, you know, we do our week of rehearsals before we play. And I, I go to his rehearsals and just watch him. I'm like, oh, you're so like, I wish like, like, I wish I was you in some ways, you know, sure. like, like, uh, like, and that's important. I think it's important to be with somebody that you admire and like look up to. And so, um, and, and our music is completely different. Yeah. You know? I mean, we have some similarities, but but his stuff is obviously much more aggressive and crazy. And I, I do sad love songs, but, um, so, but it's cool. It's like, um, it's amazing to be able to go on tour with him. Cause that was our whole plan was like, Hey, let's tour together so that we don't have to be away from our kid, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it's fun. I, I love doing that. I love the fact that Le little Leofar is going to see the world, you know, from the very beginning. I think that's so important. Yeah. yeah. That like worked out perfectly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, like we can never break up. <laughs> 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 oh, I apologize. Raphael changed it to Leofar now, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so sorry so, about that. So no. So Raphael's stage name is Leofar, which is okay. which is Raphael backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I got pregnant, um, and we found out it was a boy, and I, I said, "Man, I'm gonna pray that that he looks just like you. Like I want a reflection of you." And so I was like, "Oh, that'd be cool. Like we should name him Leofar because then he's a reflection of of Raphael." And so, um, so he still uses Leofar as his stage name, but. Uh, but I always call him Ra Raphael. Yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. How do you reflect back now with, with motherhood? You said some really interesting things earlier on about, you know, your folks and not really talking about the Utah situation because mm -hmm. did, did you, do you oh, find oh, now? Oh, 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 the Provo stuff? Yeah, the oh, yeah, Provo uh, yeah. stuff. Do you find now like being a mom that it's just like, I know for me now as a parent, it's like, fuck, my mom was amazing. Yeah. I didn't yeah. even realize until, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think, like I said, I think my parents did their best, which is really all you can do. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I also see some parts where they might have failed a bit and, sure. and, you know, just like I'm sure I will at some things too. But I think the trick is to always like do a better job the next round, right? So like maybe Leah Farr will do a better job than we did, you know, and we learn from that, you know. So I don't know. I think some things I... I I do trip out like, um, 
like my mom one time my mom's like an excellent cook and she has like these books of recipes and i remember one time flipping through and seeing this like really beautifully drawn vase uh of flowers and the perspective was really great and we have like artists on both sides of our family like my grandmother's a painter and then and then my grandfather on my mom's side is also a painter and but i had never actually seen my mom draw and i and so i assumed i'm like oh mom did grandma draw this and she's like no i did and i was like what like wait you're you're like an amazing artist you know like this is fucking great yeah and um and i wonder how much of that she missed out on you know uh, having like the role of being like the housewife, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, cause my dad was working and then she would stay at home All with right. the three of us. And, um, but you know, I'll tell you what, she's like living her best life now. Like, you know, I think my, my parents split up and now she's like, I'm going to fucking live, you know? <laughs> and she's like doing it up. And, and it's crazy. Cause I see her art, like really like come through, like even in her own house, she makes her own sure. stencils for like custom wallpaper. I'm like, this, you're so amazing, you know? And I think that's, that's really great. But again, that was like one of my biggest lessons learned is like, I don't want to ever live in regret. You know, I want to mm. be able to live life. And, um, and even when we decided to have a child, I was like, I don't want it to become my, the, the, you know, I don't want to get pigeonholed into being a mom. Like, you know, I'm not going to be like, I'm, I'm going to still be myself, you mm-hmm. know? And I think you can, have the best of both worlds. You mm-hmm. know, I don't think you have to choose. Um, although I will say that I used to be a crazy workaholic and that was probably my biggest addiction more than anything else. Um, and having a kid, it's like, oh yeah, that definitely goes into like second like priority. I'm like, oh, if I, yeah. before I used to be like, oh, I want to, you know, work on this till 3 a.m. And now I'm just like, we work from nine to five and after five is, is family time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and I look forward to five o'clock. It's like, it's really cool. I, I love that. And I don't know. I guess I just grew up. 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up. Stand firm. Believe. Make it happen and live through the madness, knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. <laughs> it brings like a, a whole new different level of discipline because yeah. you don't want to miss out. Yeah, sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, but then I look at like, you know, I, like, I don't know Nick Cave personally, but like I've heard maybe he wrote it in a book somewhere that he, he really works on a schedule too, yeah. you know, where he's like, you know, before for me, I used to get like ideas for songs at three in the morning and I would come down and play them on the piano, record them on my phone. And it's like, now I just like, no, when I songwrite, I schedule it. And it's mm-hmm. just, um, I thrive on structure and I get up early, you know, and it's yeah. like, I think I'm cool with that. I don't need to be like a dysfunctional artist. You know? <laughs> and if it works for you, then yeah, yeah, yeah. more power to you. Yeah, totally. Are you still working the program? Do you still attend meetings, groups, all that? A sponsor? Is it kind of just You know, I don't, I don't go to meetings um, because I, unfortunately, um, and, you know, again, it's not to talk shit about the program because sure. I think, think different things work for different people. Uh, I tend to be a bit of a lone wolf when it comes to my therapy, you mm-hmm. know, like uh, I do better on my own. Mm-hmm. Like I love the big book. I've read it a million times. I love the steps. I love all that. But I just have found, especially in L.A., like a lot of the places that I was going to, and I'm sure it's because I went to a lot of the wrong, like meetings that were wrong for me, mm-hmm. is that it was just a scene, you yeah. know. And I am like... I love the the anonymous part of it, you know, and I think a lot of that was lacking in some of the meetings I went to. So, I, you know, when I talk to my friends that are um, our sponsors and and uh, attend meetings all the time, they they always talk about finding these really more smaller meetings. Um, like especially like for my guy friends, they'll find all male groups and like um, in certain age brackets. And I think that 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 would have been a, a smarter idea for me to like find yeah. maybe just um, you know, I don't know. Sometimes you'd go to these meetings in LA and it would be like, Oh, these people are just like practicing their bit up there, you know? And it's like, I just would see a lot of ego and it wasn't something that I aspired to be. And so like, I just, uh, it just never really drived for for me, but you know, I have a lot of friends that like, uh, that, I mean, even some family members, that's like, that's how they get through their day. And I, I love that, you know, and, and, you know, then there's another part of me that it's like those kind of meetings work for a lot of people because 
when you see actors or musicians that you admire and you see them that they're doing it, that's really inspiring, you know, and for some people. And so I think that there's something for everybody. It's just, uh, I, I was never lucky enough to find the right meeting for myself. At one point I was like, man, I should just start having my own meetings here, you know, yeah. but I kind of always do naturally when I, cause I hang out with a lot of sober people. Mm -hmm. So like we have these conversations and, um, and yeah, so, but you know, I, I, I just celebrated 14 years. I'll be 15 in July. So That's I feel awesome. like I'm kind of, uh, pretty set in my ways about it, you yeah, know, yeah. obviously like, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I know what you mean. And yeah. it's weird for me. I mean, so many people fell off during the pandemic. Oh yeah. Unfortunately. I, I lost friends to so, so many relapses and yeah. uh, a few overdoses. Yeah. But, but, uh, you know, the zoom things and then connecting all dudes group. And yeah. It was great, but, this, but, I, but I gotta say, man, it's the zoom things don't cut it. Not as good as in person. No, it doesn't like in person is like, that's the part of like that. I think that was, when I did go to meetings that felt great was that like, it felt like the community that was physically there for you and you felt more accountable. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, especially if you have duties and it's like, like, whereas I think when you're doing via zoom, most people are, are kind of checked out. They're not as in focus. It's harder to do that, you sure. know? So that's why you get the bad internet connection. Yeah, and somebody's totally. Somebody's doing a great share. And, yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Carl, can you repeat it? We missed everything. Carl, like, damn it, <laughs> son of a bitch. Carl, you were, you know, he's frozen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and I know it wasn't a popular, um, you know, what is it, opinion? But like for me, I because I saw so many friends relapse during that time, more than more friends than that actually suffered from COVID. I was like, man, I just think sobriety is such a crucial part of our life that like um i think that that's to me it's considered essential like mm -hmm. i don't think it's something that should have been locked down or shut down you know i think that you could have taken precautions and probably saved a lot of lives and um i did lose like two friends to suicide as well and i think yeah. that that had to do with uh one of them did have to do with relapsing and so i think um you know like like i said i used to make fun of it back when i before i was sober yeah. you know and now i'm just like Oh, I could never do that, you know, because you don't know the wounded soldiers that are walking amongst you, you know, yeah. and you don't know that like so, something that is easy for you could be a lot more difficult for somebody else, you know. Yeah, yeah, we all carry that hurt differently. Yeah, we? yeah. And I mean, we've we've done a lot of like talking with people far more educated than Mikey and myself, but you know, it's, it's, you're using street drugs. It's fucking scary with yeah. the fentanyl out there. Oh, we're no. seeing a totally different crisis. And again, not to yeah. downplay COVID, but the yeah. numbers with fentanyl. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm it's glad killing. I stopped doing coke when I did because fentanyl wasn't a thought in my head. Yeah. A thought in my head was, you know, going through the sketchy neighborhoods to go get it, you know, or the cops putting yourself me. in situations. Exactly. Yeah. Like going through that. Fentanyl was the last thing on my mind, yeah. so throw that in the mix now. It's like shit. I'm glad I stopped when I yeah. did. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I think we got lucky. I mean, at yeah. least my generation was things weren't as as intense as they are now. Like I, even even with weed, to be honest, like some of the, like when I smoked weed when I was in junior high, like it was just shitty weed and like you know just like <laughs> yeah. made you hungry and kind of zone out. Now like the shit people are smoking is so intense, and I'm like. Oh, you cannot operate a vehicle on that. Like, I don't care. Like, this will make you act like a gorilla and climb yeah. buildings. <laughs> this one can make it's like, well, like you can uh, play soccer after this. Or just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. You want to bench press five hundred pounds? Here you go, skinny man. Yeah, Put your ass down there. I it's think just, I'm the rock. Yeah, it's just everything's intense. Like even like I mean, I remember doing ecstasy versus like what Molly is now. I'm like, oh, I yeah. wouldn't touch any of that stuff. You know, it's just so yeah. dangerous. I, I never cared for smoking weed, but I can't imagine smoking weed now with all the stuff they have out. I. Yeah. I'd freak out. I think so, too. Even more than I used to when I did. I never cared for weed. I yeah, was like pills too. and powders and alcohol. That's yeah, I yeah. Did. I liked you uppers, so. Me, too. <laughs> me, too. When I smoked weed, I would just be like, get home that night and just be like, Eat chips. what? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> what did I do? I don't remember anything. I was odd because like, I was one of those people that definitely the allergy with booze, but for me, it like it was an upper. Like, you yeah. Know, as it you're one of those weird ones. Yeah. yeah. As my dad was the same way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As it progressed worse and worse. And then it was like, you know, reactivation of trauma, but it was always that nobody's going to like, somebody likes Jason when he's not drunk. Yeah. And, and I'm naturally kind of a little more introverted, believe it or not, unless I'm on the yeah, stage. Same. And that's the yeah. thing. Like, yeah. okay, I'm here to entertain. Then I will switch personality. Yeah. But otherwise, 
just want to sit here and shut yeah. the fuck up. And- I remember one time I tried getting sober and this was like, I've never really talked about this before, but like I was actually married before when I, I got married in my twenties, like an idiot. I was wasted. It was to a terrible, awful person that I, I had only known for two weeks. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know why I did that because I've always held marriage as something so sacred. And I think I, I think I just, maybe that's an example of the downward spiral of drinking uh, for me at least, you know, and I remember kind of coming out of this haze going, oh shit, I'm married. I got to make this work because that's what you do. And I, I really tried to give it a go, you know, even though this person and I like, I think he was an extremely toxic person that like was not, um, I don't even think he liked me, you know, as a human. <laughs> so I'm just like, why, why am I stuck here? But I remember at one point um, saying like, I need to stop drinking. Like I'm going to kill myself, you know, I'm, I'm going to end up dead. Mm-hmm. And I remember he said what you just said, which was like, he said, oh, but you're no fun when you're not drinking. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I remember that night he was like pouring like, because I used to drink tequila. That was like my, my, uh, what is it? Poison of choice or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he just poured it down my throat. And I just remember going like, oh, well, fuck it. Maybe I'll try again tomorrow. And um, I think that night I ended up trying to throw myself in front of a car. Oh, sure. And, uh, and you know, thankfully I had a friend that stopped me. But, um, but it's like, you know, that's a perfect example of somebody not having your support or not supporting you. And like when I got sober, I just, I literally had to go through my phone and delete a majority of my friends because they weren't really my friends. Like this guy didn't care about me. He didn't give a fuck about me. Like he gave a fuck about himself, you know? And, um, and those people, like they're going to treat you like a party favor. Like that's not friendship. So then to me, it was like, I cleared out so many people in my life and it only just really made room for more like meaning, meaningful friendships and relationships after that, you know? Were real yeah. bonds scary at first? Um, like tr- not, not just tr- not only trusting them, but I had trouble trusting myself. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I'm the opposite. I was like, I think because I had like um, probably like mommy issues that like I, I just would always like fall like deeply really quickly, you know, mm. instead of taking my time, you know? I think uh, it was easy for me to chase people, especially if they were emotionally unavailable. Like, you know, um, like I kind of used to equate like struggle. Like if it doesn't hurt, it's not love. Like it's not, it's not worth it. Like you got to fight for it. And then, then it's real, yeah. like, you know, like love isn't easy. And it's like, uh, I couldn't be further from the truth, <laughs> right. you know, by the time, like I ended up going celibate for like <clears throat> three years um, after just, you know, seeing one bad relationship after another. Yeah. And um, and I was like, I'm tired of seeing this movie. I got to fix. Like, I'm I'm like the repeating factor in this, you know, because uh-huh. I keep choosing these people that don't love me or whatever. And so I remember I'm going to take a break. And then, you know, it was a couple of years after that when I, when I met Rafa or reconnected with him and, um, and really took it. I, I don't know. It wasn't really slow, but it was like, I literally made like a pros and cons list. Like wh- what are the red flags? And there wasn't any. And I was like, Oh cool. Like normally I'm like, I want your red flags. That's all I you know, like, like, Oh, red flags hanging out of your ears. Like, I love you. Like, let's get married. Like, you know, I can change those by the way. Isn't that the thing we yeah. can, cause I'm kind of a hopeless romantic. Yeah. 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 Ah, red flags. But yeah. When I'm in your life, don't worry. I can change those. Cause yeah. I'm just that yeah. powerful. What an egotistical dick I was. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, when I, let's get, talk a little tattooing. Yeah, huh? sure. Yeah. Um, Mikey, you brought up cause I, you know, I loved your work, but yeah. you recently done yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I've like blacked out could, a lot yeah. of my tattoos. And it's it's interesting because like when the tattoo shows first, well, right before the tattoo show started, I remember, you know, I was pretty heavily tattooed mm-hmm. already. Yeah. And I would go out and I would have my Julia Roberts moments at the mall, you know, like where people would like, you know, even I'm like, I'll buy this place. There's the burn it down. <laughs> like, you know? But um, and then things changed. The perception changed. But like before it was like, whoa, you have tattoos on your face. It's yeah. crazy, you know. And then, um, and so then I just had a lot of like, just, um, especially this arm was just like a mishmash of like drunken tattoos, mm. like tattoos over tattoos. And I tried lasering it and then tried covering it and that didn't work. So I lasered it and it was just a mess. Mm-hmm. And so then I met, um, this guy named hoodie. He's a tattooer from Philly who specializes in all these blackout tattoos. And I just, I would look at his Instagram and I'm like, something is so satisfying about seeing this, like it just looked so clean Mm -hmm. and like simple and I wear black every day. So it's kind of like nice, like Mm -hmm. to matches what I'm wearing. And so I, I, 
he flew out to the shop and tattooed me and we covered up um pretty much from here to here like uh, from my elbow down to my wrist and um you did your leg too no yeah i have yeah. My, my left leg my left leg was like the worst like because that's what you would i remember yeah. you would have people tattoo like steve for example would tattoo we, we would get steve drunk right, and then right. i have like drunken tattoos all all up and down my legs and yeah. i'm like i you know and i would just like i had a lot of like tattoos that I just don't fall in line with how I feel anymore sure, sure. you know it's yeah. like um so it felt good to just cover it and mm-hmm. I, so I posted a video of me like showing people my tattoo and they lost their mind mm-hmm. like they were like why would you do this to yourself this is so ugly like oh my god like I mean they would just say like they didn't understand it and I was like whoa this kind of feels cool again <laughs> like, like oh I remember when it was like, like punk rock and now yeah. it's like okay so this is a, like I like it now people are just kind of like you know weirded out by i mean there's a lot of people getting them done now but like but i i it's just for me it's a personal preference thing you know it's not that i hate my tattoos and i hate myself no i just i like the aesthetic i think it looks nice um you know uh there's some tattoos i don't really want to look at anymore Mm -hmm. and that's fine you know and so i am i'm almost finished with my left leg and then um and we've done my right arm now and i just have to finish like the inside of it next time he comes in so Uh, but I have left a few tattoos like that, I noticed yeah. that you still like have I still have a like couple. a portrait, yeah. you know, and um, you know there are some tattoos that I love, but some of them I'm just like oh, there's a certain association, you know, with a certain time in my life that I don't really want to look at anymore. Yeah. No, and that makes total sense. Yeah. And I mean, for when I got my first neck tattoo, I mean, shit, my dad didn't talk to me yeah. for like a week. Yeah. And I was just <laughs> yeah. like, and we're we're close. I'm yeah. like, dad, mom, you guys got to understand that I'm not doing this to try and piss you yeah, off. Of like course. when I was a little kid, I would draw football and basketball players and I would draw tattoos yeah, on them. Yeah. It's just something that I've always wanted. But when I got the face or the side of the face, I always call it the side of my yeah. face. Everyone's like, you got your face. I'm like, it's like this side <laughs> it's of like my your head. temple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they're just like, what? It's still your face. What? I know. I know. <laughs> I, I've admitted that. Like, yes. All right. I got my face. And it was just kind of like, just a shot. But my parents were like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, yeah, yeah. It's already there. You're going to do whatever yeah. you want anyways. And yeah. I'm like, well, I'm in my thirties. Don't live with you. So, but yeah. still thank you for that. But right on. Yeah. But yeah, no, the blackouts, I totally get it. Like it's a part of your life that you may not, you've already accepted it, got, yeah. you know, and you're better, but you don't need to see it every day. Yeah, yeah. And and here's the other part of it too. I think not, like as a tattooer, like most tattooers have like the worst tattoos ever yeah, yeah. because we got them when we were young and we were most likely practicing on exactly. ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, practicing on our friends and vice versa. So like, it's not like I had this like world renowned, beautiful arm tattoo mm-hmm. that I covered up like a total asshole. Like <laughs> I just, I covered up garbage. That's right, what it was. Right. And mm-hmm. like, and people are like, why didn't you get it lasered? I'm like, have you tried getting lasered? Because I have, and that shit hurts times a million. Yeah, what it's that's tattoo- what and heard. you have to go back, like depending on how dark it is, like yeah. 20 times. I like, heard it was gnarly. So not only is it like t- crazy expensive, crazy painful, the healing time is like, you know, sometimes up to a month, depending on how much you're getting lasered. And it's like, and that's cool if you really hate your tattoo and you don't want to look at it again. You right. know? For me, I'm like, I like the way the blackouts look, so I'll just do that. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's yeah. cool. Yeah. And, I've um, talked to uh, I've talked to some people who are like, I want to get it lasered. Like, I just need to go. I'm like, dude, I've heard horror yeah. stories about it. La- just tattoo something over it. Like, just yeah. But there's some stuff it. that you know is like so like in like you can't cover it up yeah, you know like yeah. and and i think like even if you want to go and lighten things up like like my husband he's he got like his whole left arm lightened up mm-hmm. and now he's gonna we're gonna do like a you know santa muerte tattoo on him or something oh, like cool. that. That's but um but yeah and and i do respect laser because i think it, it works really great sure. but if that's what you want i mean yeah. I, my laser guy like he can make a tattoo look like it was never there and yeah, yeah. and your skin looks beautiful and that's great I just, for me, I'm like, I'm not trying to be not tattooed. I like tattoos. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, yeah. I love all my tattoos. I get some people that ask me, you know, do you regret any of them? Yeah. And I'm like, no. I mean, I have a Y'all girlfriend's just, name. Just, just the portrait of your mom. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just kidding. I have it. <laughs> that clip out and sending it to him. Yeah, right? I, I have got your mom right on my back, you know what? <laughs> I have an ex's name on me, and that's, you know, if you could see it yeah. if, like, I pointed it out. Sure. But if not, you wouldn't. But it's like, I don't regret any of them yeah. because it's just Little tattoos. Land- landmarks in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. but even the blackouts, like, you wear them well. Thank they you. look dope. Thank yeah. you. So it's like, yeah. If you like yeah, it, it's kind yeah. of dug it. I know, it like, goes uh, back to fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Tim Comerford bases from uh uh, Rage Against the Machine. Oh, yeah, that's right. The cool yeah. dope ones. Yeah. Like, forever. Forever ago. Cool, yeah. But, but yeah, you're right. And I think that people that 
maybe don't have tattoos and don't understand yeah. it's much like music it's kind of like a time machine like yeah. mine's from gi joe yeah i love this that one here and <laughs> yeah. i got my bat you know and i got my full arm plan but yeah i can finally afford it now uh, yeah out of radio you know <laughs> two kids ex-wife yep. it's like yeah you can't exactly afford the good work no kids i got this <laughs> but, uh, got this. but yeah i think people just that maybe don't have them don't get that that this yeah. is something that it's kind of like this thing there's a reason we make it permanent and it could yeah. be fucking silly who cares totally it's like it's and that's why i had to like explain on instagram is like man like you know i've been tattooing since i was 14 years old like for a majority of my life tattooing has been my life and i have seen every kind of tattoo under the sun like the worst things that you could imagine to like, you know, the most beautiful things and, or things that I just would never personally get. And you know what? Never once have I felt inspired to tell the person what I think. Yeah. I'm just like, cause you don't know why they got what they got. You know, like, I mean, I've, I've, I've tattooed, um, you know, scribble, scrabble of a child, the child's drawing on a parent that, you know, lost his child. Mm -hmm. Like that tattoo is so important to them and so beautiful to them. But if somebody doesn't know, they'll be like, what's that piece of crap? And it's like, well, that piece of crap is a little bit more than that, you yeah, know? Yeah. So to me, I've always just been like, Hey, whatever flows your boat. You know what I mean? Like, um, I just don't feel inspired to criticize, you know? And so I, I had said that in my Instagram post was like, Hey, like, just remember like, you know, your idea of, um, beauty can be somebody's idea of ugliness and vice versa. So like, just, you know, before you judge, like, you know, don't, don't, you know, think about it, you know, mm -hmm. but people are still going to be like, that's just ugly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, whatever. Blocked. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just like, uh, you know what? Fuck yeah. Fuck your mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have like, cause you've tattooed some really cool people. Do you do, like Lemmy was, that yeah. was cool. That was my favorite. Cause yeah, I me too. Motorhead Everybody and, loves Lemmy yeah. too. Yeah. It's like Love one Lemmy. of my bands. Like, you know, I, I voice, <laughs> yeah, um, of course. Do you have like some of those memories of people? Like you mentioned the person that lost a child yeah. or something that, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, I, it's crazy. I remember every single tattoo I've done, you know, I'll remember wow. a tattoo more so than a name because I'm, I've stared at it for the sure, hours yeah. that I've tattooed it. Um, you know, I've seen tattoos I did when I was 16 that I, that surfaced. And I'm like, I remember exactly what I was doing that day. It's like, um, I think it means just as much to me as it does to that person. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think some of the, the stories that I've heard throughout my life have been like the most inspiring, uh, things and have actually shaped me, you know, and they've actually helped me a lot. Cause, um, I, I tend to be quite, um, emotionally intimate with people, like, especially when you're spending that much time. And I also do a lot of portraits. So yeah. usually people are getting portraits because it's somebody that means something to them on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's a celebration or a morning. And so, you know, I, I definitely kind of, I, I, I just don't shy away from talking about feelings and stuff. And, um, so yeah, you know, you end up reflecting a lot and I think I, I have my clients to thank for, you know, the way that I am in a lot of ways and in, in, in good ways. And I think that's good. Yeah. 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 So we're saying, screw it. We're moving to Indiana. <laughs> huh? Yeah. <laughs> you and Raphael just decide, Hey, this is where we want to raise Lafar. Yeah. Kind of out of different. Totally. Or? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, we just, we, well, first of all, we found this house that's like a really special house. And mm -hmm. it, it was operating as, as a bed and breakfast for over a decade. Mm -hmm. And then it went on the market and I was like, you know, I've, it's been on the, the historical homes <clears throat> of America registry and stuff. And, uh, so I had my eye on it for a long time and it's in the middle of nowhere, kind of in a really small, tiny town. Um, and I said, Hey, let's just fly out there and look at it. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just to see. And we just fell in love with it. We love that town. Um, we love it because it's small. So we're hoping people don't flock there, you know, and change right. it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, I think I was just so impressed by the people there. You know, it was just a lot of patriots, a lot of, uh, working class. Like when, and when I say working class, I'm talking about real working class people. And I feel like that's kind of like the heartbeat of this country and being living in the city, you kind of, I feel like people that live in the city, myself included at one point, like flattered myself into thinking that like what I do is so important but when you think about like how we feed this country and like yeah. the farmers and the truckers and people that actually are doing backbreaking work like um and I'm sitting here doodling on people you know not to say that that's not an important job in itself but like you know 
uh, like I would hear these terms of like, you know, like flyover states. And I'm like, like they're, oh, you just fly over those states. You don't even have to know what they look like or what they're, it's like, no, those are the, those are the states that are actually like, you would be nothing without them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, so I just really fell in love with that. And I, and I remember at nighttime, I, my husband and I took a walk around the little town. I mean, it's a town of like less than 10,000 people. It's tiny. There's no Uber. There's no Postmates, you know, um, no billboards, which is fucking refreshing. Um, <laughs> and I hate being bombarded by ads all day. Um, but um, I remember just seeing it was around like six o'clock or so, at, like um, the sun had set and every house that we passed by had a little light on in the dining room and you could see people sitting at a table eating mm. together. And that's how I was raised. Mm. Like we, you know, we sat down, we prayed, we ate together and, and we talked about our day. Like we unpacked our day as a family. Like that was, nobody ate on the couch. We didn't, um, you know, like we weren't abandoned by our parents, you know? And I just was like, I walk around my neighborhood here and it's the opposite, mm -hmm. you know, there's just that family like structure isn't really like people aren't as stoked on that as they are. And I'm not, that's just that's obviously a generalization. There's some sure. people like that here, but that was something that just really to me, I was like, you know, I want to raise Leofar in nature and in this kind of at atmosphere. And we're like walking or spitting distance from the Ohio river. And I don't know. I just, we just fell in love with it. And everybody that like, I haven't taken a lot of my friends out there, but the few that have, have ended up buying property there. And they're like, you know, so we're kind of creating this cool community. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, my brother um, just bought in, in Indianapolis. So yeah. I, uh, yeah. See, I and I, I don't know Indiana at all. Like yeah. I, I literally don't know it at all. Like I just know that little tiny town, it's in South, the South part of Indiana. Um, I've been to Indianapolis like on tour, but you know, when you're on tour, it's like, you don't really get to see much other yeah. than the hotel or whatever. But I have um, a really good friend in Cincinnati and, that's like, you know, 32 miles away or something. So it's kind of, and it's like two and a half hours from Nashville. So it's, it's kind of like central, you know, yeah. mm. and, um, and it comes on a bunch of acres of land and I'm all about growing our own food. And, um, so I'm excited about, you know, really being self-sufficient. I think that's going to be super important. And it's something that people I hope will start to pay attention to, um, like creating a homestead. I think like, you know, you're looking at what's going on in the world right now you know even with just with all this shortages like the food shortages are getting real the infl inflation is getting real and it's like being able to grow your own food and be not dependent on the government i think is a really important thing you know so um you know we're lucky enough to be able to to have that you know to be able to like find this place and and purchase it and um you know there's we, I, I do want to put like a water well on the land and you know get some you know some type of energy our own energy if we if That's need cool. be and uh fuck the government you yeah. know <laughs> <laughs> so i'm curious when you go is it la is completely are you like selling everything like property and stuff like are you done with la when you leave or is yeah it so originally gonna we were back? gonna we, we said hey let's just buy this place and then we'll just go back and forth sure. you know yeah. and see what happens but i just think that like at the rate that things are going like we just feel more like at home there sure. and i yeah. think it's like um you know, I've lived in Hollywood all my life. Yeah. Like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm good on traffic. I'm good on, like... You've I don't... done the L.A. thing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's like... I think the only thing that was really holding us back was this beautiful house because mm -hmm. I spent, like, six years restoring it. And It is but, gorgeous. But, the the th but we kept thinking, like, we're not never going to be here, and that's mm -hmm. a shame. Like, yeah. this this house needs to be enjoyed by a family, you know? So hopefully we find somebody that, that will, won't destroy it, you know, and yeah. paint everything white and make it modern but we first um, walked in and i was like this is exactly what i imagined with cat <laughs> a haunted D. mansion yeah like i was just like this is the house that i yeah I, dark red you know yeah. just like the beautiful chairs and tables but just <laughs> The, you know, gothic the candles, feel. the yeah. gothic feel, yeah. yeah. The, uh, the claymore is my favorite. Oh, yeah. I'm really into knives and swords. I was well, like, well, that one is a special cool. one actually because that one, when I first met Lemmy, he um, he came into my shop and um, and I had this old, uh, it was like a a fake dagger, like a costumey kind of dagger sword hanging on the wall, and it was super cheesy, you know. And he was just like, ugh. 
that is not a real sword. And I was like, I know. And he, and I gave him a tattoo and he's like, you know what? I have a gift I want to give to you. Like come by the house afterwards. And I was like, cool. So I, I stopped by and he opened the door and I think he was like wearing like sweats or something that you would never imagine him wearing. And he's just holding up this giant sword and he's like, here you go. Thank you for my tattoo. And it was like the sweetest thing ever. And, and so it's, that came from Lemmy. Yeah. And it's, wow. it's a two handed, is... a two handed German sword. It's in a like. Oh, I a thought real, it was a Scottish claymore, but yeah. No, it's it's a re, it's a real. Uh, it's not like a replica. It's like really fucking heavy. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I saw Can that I it was. It? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for <laughs> sure. It came from Lemmy, dude. I, I didn't yeah. want to pick it up without. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's real. Um, I actually pointed that out to Mike yeah. before we started. Talking. He was like, dude, check this. I'm like, don't touch it. <laughs> don't touch anything in here. <laughs> this, yeah, it's not right. your house. <laughs> it's um, fine. Yeah. Well, I know we're running short on, on time, but uh, we always like to uh, throw some uh, fun random questions cool. and then uh, jump into kind of leave you with the last words of inspiration sure. and stuff. Uh, Mikey, you want to go first? So I, I think I might know this answer, but I'm going to ask anyways. Okay. If you can have dinner with anybody in the whole world, dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, my gosh. Anybody. God, I don't. I have no idea how to answer this one. Let's see. Um, Okay, well, I used to always say Beethoven because I'm a huge Beethoven That's fan. That's who I thought it was That's gonna be. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like he. I would be too scared to make him my option because what if he didn't like me? That's what I go in when I talk to people like, you know, bigger names like you. I walk into, <laughs> that's the story of my life. That's my job. It's like, I wonder if Kat Bunny's going to like me. I wonder oh, if no, Charlie Sheen's going to like me. We're like, going to be I great friends. I love this. Yeah. All right, cool. But you know, well, because Beethoven had a reputation for, um, you know, really making fun of people who would attempt to play his music. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I mean, I could play your music, but I would never play in front of you. Right, you know? right, right. So I don't know. I feel like, um, I, I guess... I don't know. We, we probably would get along. Who knows? <laughs> I think, yeah. I think it is. So yeah. him, that's your answer? Yeah. I always wonder with like, the classic composers, like, this is not even the way I composed it. I know. This is not, it's staccato, you know, or whatever. It's like, oh, exactly. the, whole, the whole world's yeah. out wrong. Um, if you could uh, um, tattoo any one person that you have yet to, because like you said, you yeah. create that intimacy. Who yeah. would it be? And it can't be Mike here. Or, we know that's your dream tattoos. <laughs> yeah, it's true, true. But is there someone um, that, that maybe has tattoos? You're like, man, it'd be cool as shit to sit down and tattoo them and talk with them. Well, I know that there has always been like an urban legend that Dolly Parton has tattoos. Right. And, uh, and I just think she's so amazing. I feel like she'd be the funnest person to yeah. be around. I mean, I wouldn't even have to tattoo you, you know, just yeah. like, you know, just to hang out. I think she's, she just seems like such a you know, a light of fire. I love she it. is a spitfire, yeah. man. She's yeah. just like, she's like, I'm Dolly and I know it. And <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do my thing. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 Um, if you were stranded on a deserted island and mm -hmm. you can only take with you one movie and one album, what would it be? The Cure Disintegration would be the album. I think that's the fastest we ever had anyone answer. <laughs> uh -huh. It takes some like, yeah. damn, dude. <laughs> but. And then the movie, I would say, um, I'm a big Hodorowsky fan, so I feel like it would be either El Topo or The Holy Mountain, one of those. But yeah, it would be one of those. Okay. <laughs> those are more noir films, right? They're just like, um, they're like very avant-garde, uh, kind of mystic films from, you know, the 70s, 60s, yeah. 70s. But um, Hodorowsky's like, I just think his mind is so amazing. Just the, um, the cinematic, uh, his cinematic approach is like very do it yourself, but still like, it's like, you know, when you see something and you're like, fuck, why didn't I think of that? Like, I wish I could have thought of that, you know, like I'm jealous in the best way possible. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And I, I love his poetry and his uh, writings and stuff. I think he's a, a beautiful philosopher. So I don't know. He kind of has that auteur nature to him. Yeah. 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 Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was thinking of someone was like, yeah, that's what happened to me as a kid when I saw Star Wars for the first time. <laughs> Damn it, George Lucas. Why are you this? Um, I, was, I don't know if we should ask that question because Kat is a vegan. The, that's why I didn't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> We have this question that we do with everybody, but Mikey asks it better. I so. ask it to everyone, but I know you're a vegan, so uh -huh. I'm going to ask you. Um, I'm a vegetarian, <laughs> yeah, so I yeah, get it. Yeah. But uh, it's, would you rather fight one horse-sized chicken or 10 chicken-sized horses? Oh, okay. But you Let's wouldn't see. ever harm an animal. Yeah, so. you yeah, just got but, an award for that. But I, but I also think that, like, you know, 
like okay so when i was little i was obsessed with spiders and i used to check out this book from the library called arachnids and their kin and i memorized like i was such a nerd like it was crazy but like i could draw the anatomy of a spider by memory <laughs> yeah. i was a goth nerd <laughs> um but uh so anyways uh, uh one of the fun f fun facts in the book is that like a tarantula has two like their most deadliest enemies is there's like a the spider uh wasp or whatever it's like mm. a, a hawk's a hawk wasp or something mm. it's a wasp that can come from above and like sting and then ants and i just thought wow ants how are ants so like dangerous to a tarantula it's because like strength in numbers right they could totally they attack the and army. they and they can't fight that so i was like so i think if i had to choose between fighting like T a bunch of tiny chickens or a giant one i would probably choose the giant one and have like a better chance <laughs> i didn't think about it with the ant thing because if they get you on the ground you're fucked yeah but a horse-sized chicken i mean one pet, oh no yeah that is a, it's like a dinosaur so, you're right we talked to chuck liddell he wanted to fight all of them <laughs> he's like give me he all the like, big ones and all the little ones. <laughs> andy roy too and he's like i want to fight them all like, uh, andy was dope. um oh uh, last uh, quick question. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what mm -hmm. would it be? Hmm. Um, I don't know. When I was a kid, it used to be flying because I thought the idea would be so cool to fly. But I don't know if I'd care about that anymore. Um, and then, and then, and then you think about like time traveling or pausing time. That's like then they would ruin the magic of the present moment. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Wow, that was deep, but true. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, Damn. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think I wouldn't choose any. I think I would just be as as is. I'm already a superhero. Hell yeah. That's probably the best it. answer we've gotten. I love, it. I love it. Awesome. Well, we like to leave the guests with the last words, Kat. So, you know, any inspiration you can lend. Maybe it's, you know, people struggling with mental health, addiction, the combination thereof. They yeah. tend to go hand yeah. in hand, right? So pearls of um, wisdom. But just... You know, maybe even people, you know, especially maybe there's a, you know, a young lady out there, a young man, anybody that's a fan of you yeah. and kind of looks I, well, I suck at Well, I suck at advice for sure. Um, I do want to say thank you so much for having me and oh, thanks for coming you. to the house too. Thanks, thanks for having us. Like, um, it's always nice to have people over and yeah, yeah. welcome them in and stuff. And uh, I think I, all I can say is that if there's anybody out there that's struggling, obviously, if you feel like um, that you can't do it, I know it sounds weird, but like, and it's super cliche, but as an example, if I can do it, you can do it. And you're not alone in this. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Thank you're you amazing. guys. <laughs>